is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Gravity Falls Season 2, Episode 10, Northwest Mansion Mystery. In this episode... So, this show is like a comrade, right? Like, they really... As much as it is made by actors who have plenty of money, they seem to be pretty aware of shit. This episode is not as much of a joke as it may seem. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Melanie for commissioning this episode. Melanie is here in the chat. Hi, Melanie. <clears throat> she has got her cat and she is ready to go. So yeah, this episode, guys, is one of those that's like so incredibly... It, 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 <laughs> I, I confess, as a child. There was a lot about the lives of the rich that I thought was an exaggeration for the sake of a funny line or an, you know, just the comedic value of it, the absurdity of it. And the older I get, the more that I realize there is very little out there that I have seen about the lives of the rich. That's an exaggeration. It is not that far off. And this episode being about a bunch of rich people taking advantage of the people of the town in order to get what they want, promising them everything in the world. And then immediately, not only like backing out of the agreement, but then basically being like, oh, and what are you going to do about it is so incredibly accurate that I don't even know where to start because there is, there is no joke here. This is capitalism, kids. This is how it works. We are promised things in exchange for our labor and the goalposts get moved and moved and moved and not only are the goalposts moved in terms of what we are to expect, but then we are gaslit into thinking that we asked too much and that it's our own fault that we didn't get what we were asking for, etc. This episode is about a ghost coming back and taking vengeance and frankly... I would welcome that. It would be great. Guys, we're in the middle right now of a pandemic. And despite the fact that there are people dying because they do not have access to health care, because they do not have access to paid time off, because they do not have access to affordable child care, because... Because, because nobody with the actual power and, uh, and b- ability to change these things and make it so that the rest of the world is maybe a little bit less at risk has actually done so. You know, the, the only thing that we have seen is a payroll tax that is supposed to be like maybe put off a little bit. And let's be honest, if you're just missing work, you're not going to benefit from a payroll tax reduction because you're not getting payroll. It doesn't matter. It's once again, simply going to benefit people who are able to make it to work. Once again, only the people on top get anything out of it. So this whole thing is just, this episode has a lot of jokes in it. And it was hard to find any of it funny 
because like the the only parts that are really genuinely funny are with Mabel and her friends. But otherwise, it is too goddamn true. It's a very, very slight exaggeration. Not much. Really not much. And it is so gross. And I'm so tired of it, you guys. What has to happen? What has to happen? I'm genuinely asking. And I'm asking myself as much as anybody, you know, what are we supposed to do? I don't know. But man, this episode just like I watched it at a very appropriate time in our nation's history. It feels very pointed on the part of the writers. And I just I really wonder about what this means about the people who are writing this show, because I feel like they get it. But of course, you know, they're definitely going to be the people who are doing the voice work, for instance, are going to be making plenty of money, but they're not part of the same kind of problem. They're not hoarders, you know, they make plenty, but they're not the kind of people that I'm worried about, like genuinely like. So anyway, I'm going to get started, but I want y'all to know the mood in which I am coming at this episode and it can't be helped. It's just part of the way things are going here. So yeah, we start off, we are at the, um, the Northwest mansion and I don't know her parents' names actually, now that I'm realizing Pacifica and her, like her parents, I don't know. Um, but either way, her mother is saying that the guest list is so diverse. And he says, yes, a nice mix of millionaires and billionaires. <sighs> like right out of the gate. I'm like, that is not that far off, guys. It's just not. Um, so they turn and look at Pacifica, who's all dressed up. And her mother says, I told you that the theme is sea foam green, not lake foam green. Go change it. And Pacifica argues about how she kind of likes this dress. And her father rings a bell in response to which she immediately says, yes, father, and begins to walk away. Honestly, I'm a little bit surprised that this doesn't turn out to be more of a thing. The fact that her father's ringing a bell at her. I expected this to be like another spooky mind control kind of plot point, you know, but it turns out it's kind of just his way of dismissing her and instructing her to do what she's told. I really thought that there was going to be like a Pavlov's dog kind of you know, cause and effect to this, but it's just a, a, a habit, I guess. Um, and she tends to cave right away as soon as he rings it. So they're in the middle of this conversation when all of a sudden everything starts lifting up off the tables and he says, oh no, it's happening in such a way as to be like, yeah, we knew this was coming, but I didn't really put together that this was something that he expected in that it was going to occur tonight. I thought it was going to be that, oh, it's happening. Like we've had this problem before and I was hoping that it wouldn't act up while we have guests, but apparently it's going to fuck up our night. So we're going to need to take care of it, even though up to now we've just sort of lived with it. That was sort of the way that I heard that line. But it turns out that this is something that has they've been sort of like waiting for. Um, so all of these things begin to fly around. The uh, glasses and plates are shattering. And they're talking to Pacifica about somebody that they could hire to fix this issue. And just as they're saying that, one of the newspapers, Gravity Falls Gossiper, gets tossed on the floor in front of them. And on the front page is a picture of Dipper. It says, Mystery Solver Catches Vampire Bat. And it's a picture of Dipper 
using something that's got like electroshock on a huge bat in like what looks like a watchtower. And the two cops are like holding on to each other and screaming in terror. It's actually pretty good. I rather liked it. Um, and that is who Pacifica goes and asks for help. And he does not want to help. It is understandable. I wouldn't either. And once he winds up finding out exactly what's going on here, it's such a perfect moment because he initially doesn't want to help. He tells her like, why should I trust you? Why should I do this and that? He finally agrees. She seems to be maybe a little bit cooler than he thought. And he's walking out going to himself. Maybe she's not so bad. And then sure enough, finds out like five minutes later that they were completely full of shit. This whole thing was like a lie in order to just be able to continue to have the exclusive party that they wanted. It's amazing to see this this moment of like, maybe this rich person isn't so terrible. And sure, it's definitely, oh, Austin is saying it's not spooky. It's just abusive, which is creepier. That's true. Um, even though Pacifica is being abused by her father, even though it is a shit way to grow up in many ways that will damage her. It's also undeniably still, she is like in such a position of privilege that it is really hard for me to have the kind of empathy that I want to have for somebody like this. Like I do have some, but I just, you know, like the, the, the kind of thing with this is like, yeah, okay. I'm sure he's going to do his share of damage to your psyche, but you know what? Once you get old enough, you're going to be able to afford to go to therapy every day. You're going to be able to afford to go to therapy all day, every day, if you want. You're going to be, afford, be able to afford to do anything you need to heal yourself and move forward in your life. And that is a kind of advantage that is just, you know, it's unheard of. So, uh, but at first, before we go there, Dipper... <laughs> He's sitting in the mystery shack. He's got soda and chips and pizza and Doritos. And he's watching the television. It says, you asked for it. You got it. An entire 48 hour marathon of ghost harassers. Guys, ghost harassers is so perfect. Uh, on the used to be about history channel. Y'all, this is obviously like about ghost adventures, right? I cannot believe that ghost adventures got popular. And I'll just say it like ghost hunters. Okay. I see it. There's a lot of ghosty shows. I'm not against ghost shows that I've thought were pretty well done. Have y'all watched Ghost Adventures? Ghost Adventures, and it might be hosted by somebody else now, but the first year that it came out, first of all, the name Ghost Adventures is so fucking terrible that that right there, I'm just like, who came up with that name? I just like, what, really? Secondly, the host is this fucking doofus meathead gelled haired idiot who is so goddamn dense i mean you hear the guy talk and he he definitely has the sound of one of those guys in a comment section that uses a lot of words that you can tell he doesn't actually know the meaning of and he tries to sound really educated but in trying exposes how very uneducated he is. And I can't, I still to this day am blown away at the fact that that show picked up the kind of steam it did because I, the first time I watched it when I was like, what? I must've been like 19 or 20. It, I was young enough I was cracking up and just like, you've got to be kidding me. These f fucking guys, seriously, there's no way the show is going to do. It. And then like, it just took off and I am so angry about it. I'm still so pissed. It's one thing for a show like Jersey Shore to take off where you kind of get the appeal of watching this train wreck and these ridiculous people, but ghost adventures 
combined with Jersey Shore just does not feel like a thing that people should want to watch. And yet here we are. And and being called ghost harassers is so perfect because the episode that I particularly remember that I was like, are people seriously enjoying this? They're like standing in this room and he's just basically like, are you there? If you're there, why don't you come at me? Why don't you come at me? Are you scared? Huh? Are you scared? And he's like genuinely like trying to start a fight with a ghost. It is. I mean, words cannot put. I I can't do it. Austin says, bro, I'm going to punch a ghost, bro. Precisely. Exactly. I mean, I just, oh, I get so mad thinking about that show and the mediocrity of dudes and the fact that they can just fall backward into success by accident. Ugh, gets me so mad. So Dipper is planning to have a long sit-in of of binging the show. And honestly, <clears throat> I am a little jealous. I had a bit, so last week, um, I was supposed to be on vacation and I got sick instead and I wound up binging Miss Marple because it's very comforting and I had never watched it before, but I binged all of the olds and then all of the new ones, um, or I'm partway through the new ones. I'm almost done. And I would love to have a voluntary binge session. I haven't had one in a long time. The last time I think that I had a day where I was like, I know I'm going to be sitting here watching television all day was when Rashawn visited for LeakyCon and we did the um, John Wick Marathon. <clears throat> and even that, because it was for the camera, it couldn't be the same kind of thing. You know, it wasn't going to be totally relaxed, just chilling out. You were, I, I was aware that I had to pay attention, that I had to get Rashawn to pay attention, that we were going to record on it afterward. I want a day where I just get a bunch of junk food and watch TV for a long time. I haven't had that in a while. And uh, I am sure that by the end of it, I would kind of be like, that was a mistake. I don't feel good after doing that. <clears throat> but <clears throat> sorry, guys, my throat is just kind of not quite back. But um, I would like the option and I am jealous of Dipper here for this. So anyway, he gets interrupted for breaking news. And at this point, Mabel and Candy come and sit on either side of him. And then Grenda says, make room for Grenda and just comes charging in and lands right on top of everybody. And it is really Grenda never change. Um, and it turns out that they are, uh, the news is the Northwest Watch, and they are all standing outside of the Northwest Mansion, waiting to catch glimpses of all of the high society types that are about to come through the gates. And this is another one of those things where I'm like, I don't really relate, but I do kind of get it. Like, this isn't something that I would particularly care about, but I compare it to something like maybe the um, royal wedding where you're going to see a lot of like celebrity types and you kind of just want to be able to see who you can spot in the crowd. And it's just something fun and interesting to do and an, uh, an air of excitement to it. So for me, like I don't – I'm not really into celebrities too much. Like <clears throat> I'm not somebody – I'm sorry, guys. I have to take a sip of water here. Ugh killing me. <clears throat> I am not particularly interested in meeting many celebrities. There's like a handful that I could say I would be very excited about. <clears throat> James Marsters is one of them because of reading the Dresden Files and because he seems really cool. Beyonce, but honestly, I think I would just fall apart so completely that while I want to meet her, I also, it's my greatest fear. So, you know, um, I'm trying to think who else is a celebrity that I would like be really excited about. Other than that, and that's all like meeting them. The idea of just being off to the side 
and getting to see them walk by is a real like that one I just don't get. I don't understand the excitement of just being like, oh, I see so and so. I guess, you know, like, I just, I don't know. They're just people. I, 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 you know what I'm saying? So this is just like, to a point, I I can understand like the excitement, but then there's another part of me that's like, I still really don't. And the news is even saying, even though common folk aren't let in, That won't stop us from camping out for a peek at the fanciness. And Mabel and uh, Candy and Grenda are all saying, ooh. And Dipper is more of my mindset. Can anyone please explain why people care about this? Grenda says, it's pretty much the best party of all time. Rich food, richer boys. And Mabel says, They say each gift basket has a live quail inside. Now, there's something I can get on board with. Have you guys seen the episode of The Sopranos where Christopher finds out what's in the Oscar gift bags? I think it's the Oscars. I remember there was a spread in a magazine when I was a teenager that showed every item that was in the gift bags that people were getting. And the overall value of everything in this gift bag was somewhere in the neighborhood of $12,000. There was, I think, an iPad in the gift bag that I'm remembering. It was like one of the first iPads ever released. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I couldn't have been a teenager then. I had to be in my early 20s. Um, there was a pair of like designer sunglasses that were like eleven hundred dollars, uh, a perfume that was like in this like gold like diamond encrusted thing. So like the perfume wasn't super valuable, but it was like a uh, special edition like bottle that had diamonds on it. It was the kind of thing that at the time I was just dazzled by it, and I thought that was amazing. And now I am so angry. I get so mad thinking about it, that there are people who are already rich, already could have any of these items for the asking, any moment of their lives, but they're being given stuff that is worth this much for no reason other than that they are already so famous and rich. And that value of $11,000, $12,000 for this gift bag could be life-changing money. For many people. And it's a gift bag. Like it's just, you know, so like I understand these girls mindsets because I had it at one time for this kind of thing. But now that I've gotten older, it's really hard for me to like sit back and sort of enjoy that for what it is. I I just get so enraged all over again thinking about it. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. So anyway... They are all talking about how Pacific Northwest is Pacific Northwest is the worst. And he says, I'm I'm not just saying that out of jealousy. I would say that to her face. He opens the door. There she is. She says, I need your help. And he says, you're the worst. And then he slams the door in her face. And honestly, I have to give some respect to Dipper for standing by his ideals there. He, He did what he said he would do. All right. You know. Um, so she continues knocking. She's by the way, incognito, meaning that she's got sunglasses and a trench coat and, uh, a big, what do you call it? Scarf covering her hair. And she tells him, do you think it's easy for me to come here? I don't want to be seen in this hovel. And as she says that she waves away <clears throat> all these bugs that are flying around her head. I am sorry for having to clear my throat so much guys. Um, And she tells him, there is something haunting the manor, and if you don't help, the party could be ruined. Name your price. And Mabel comes and pulls him away and is like, dude, you had better get us some goddamn tickets to this fucking party. You're being given this opportunity. Don't let me down, bruh. Come on, do this for me. And 
he looks and sees Grenda and Candy with their eyes all full of stars. And he's like, fine. And so he does it in exchange for the party tickets. And she says, you're just lucky I'm desperate. And he gives them three tickets that are in these like gold envelopes with like a diamond, uh, like stuck to the back of each one. It's pretty good. I love it. And then Mabel says, Grenda, get the glue gun for making dresses. And I talked about this actually in an episode of uh, Dresden Files that's going to be coming out next week, I think, um, that if I got rich, I would be like the most gauche rich person. I would be so trashy with it. Like, just forget it. And this like, get the glue gun. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Ah, love you, Mabel. So we see everybody pulling up to the front of this house. The main gate opens with a clang and lets the like fancy cars inside. And the girls get let into Northwest Manor. And it is really something. It looks like the lobby of like a hotel. Um, There is a like full skeleton of some sort of like prehistoric beast hanging from the ceiling. It is pretty cool. There's a cider fountain. There is a ice uh, carving of Pacifica as a mermaid on her cell phone, which is really the best idea I've ever heard. I love it so much. And Mabel is wearing the weirdest dress. It's a very like, uh, it's a very royal wedding kind of outfit, like the hat the the little fascinator that she has on is very very similar to something that was worn to the royal wedding um the royal wedding between will and kate not the one that was like a couple years ago um but yeah i just i love this I, she goes up to the butler and is talking about what a fancy man he is and they open their gift baskets and there's a live partridge in it and three baby partridges that go running off and it is just perfection so her parents come up and talk to Dipper about what's going on. And they tell her to take him to the problem room, but to make sure first that he's not going to be wearing what he's wearing. So he is forced to go put on a tuxedo. It is a pretty great moment. He's standing in this dressing room. This is the kind of thing that I'm talking about, guys. The Northwest family successes are all on the wall behind uh, Pacifica. And we see a guy standing on this like cliff's edge. We see a guy shaking hands with a Native American. We see a dude holding up bags filled with apples and everybody seeming to like cheer, which I assume is him feeding them, I guess is supposed to be like what's happening in that story. Later on, we'll see a different version of things. But this like, the walk-in closets are one of those things that I like it's I want so bad and I also like I don't know that I could live with myself if I had a walk-in closet like this a walk-in closet that would be about the size of what my bedroom is now part of me is like oh that'd be so great and another part of me is like Natasha don't don't do that um and there is a sort of montage of all of uh, the girls figuring out what's going on at this party and who's coming. And they find an, a book of the um, the guests and they have like their photos, their statuses, their ages. He's 13 status rich. <clears throat> Marius von Fundhauser, which is just, I guess, money house. Um, after inheriting his father's cravat and epaulettes factory at the age of seven, Marius Marius von Fundhausen, uh, von, von Fundhauser quickly rose to prominence as the richest rich boy in Richardson's Richington Rich Boys Rich Academy. Further rich, he richly riched, and that is the rest of the entry. Guys, I love jokes like that. I love jokes that you have to like be able to pause it and look at it. It's the best. It's so good. And ah, uh, yeah, they decide that maybe this guy is out of our league and we are all going to 
like come to an agreement together that we will not pursue him. Candy says he's a white whale hunting him will destroy us. So they decide to swear a sister's truce not to waste time on him. And they all put their hands in and agree, but they all sort of smile and laugh in this way that indicates that they really don't have any intention of following through on that at all. So yeah, that's going to be a thing later. Um, Dipper is led to the room where it's all going on. And he ha- says that there is uh, a category categorization of ghosts up to category 10. And, uh, He says that this one, because it's just falling plates, falls under category one, which says, eh, kind of cute. And it's a Casper looking ghost with one of those little uh, spinning propeller hats on. And it's just floating dishes with its fat cheeks. And it's sort of adorable. And he thinks that this is going to be no big deal. And we just have to splash this place with some anointed water. It'll be no big deal. But as he's saying this, he p- starts picking up something on his little ghost tector dealy, and he gets drawn over to this painting of a lumberjack and it spikes way, way up, but then it's gone and he thinks maybe there's something wrong with it. And then he looks up and the lumberjack is not in the painting anymore. And they look up and all of a sudden, all of the, because there's like tons of heads of animals on the walls, all of these heads of animals begin uh, dripping blood and chanting ancient sins, ancient sins. And things begin flying around the room. The fire in the fireplace flares up. All of the stuff that's like... uh the there's like a cloud like towards the ceiling that begins to spin around um and he's like oh shit this is definitely not a category one and then the animals say ancient blood and blackened skies the forest dark once more shall rise and he says as she starts to freak out and say what do we do he says it can't get any worse than this but as he says that A huge skeleton with a hatchet buried in its head crawls out of the fire and then begins to stand. And all of a sudden this like, I guess, sort of like a ectoplasm coagulates around the skeleton to make flesh and clothing until the the dude in the painting is standing there. And he yells, I smell a northwest. Come out, come out wherever you are. And he's like walking through, dragging his huge axe behind him, which is cutting a furrow in the floor. And his beard is made out of blue flames. And I was like, this is actually pretty rad. Okay. And Dipper opens his uh, book to see what the advice is for a category 10. And it just says, pray for mercy. Yikes. So at this point, Pacifica's father is greeting some people who are arriving at the party. So we've got, and this is a great moment because you can see um, the two FBI agents arriving, but of course, you know, we don't know who they are. Like they're in enough disguise that as an illustration, you're just kind of like, huh, who's that? But there is a dude who's like a Duke and Duchess who just have that fucking look. They really do. Um, Welcome Dukes and Duchesses, Sultans and sportsmen and reclusive 102 year old mayor of Gravity Falls, Mayor Befuftelfumpter. Oh, guys, I maintain that that joke about that, like, English, I that might still be, like, one of my favorite jokes that this show has ever done. But I am really excited that we get another kind of version of that joke here. Mayor Befuftelfumpter. Ah, oh, that's so excellent. And all of these, um, 
all of these vultures fly in and the mayor just says, don't worry, they're with me. They're just circling him, waiting for him to die. Oh, man, that's so funny to me. So tonight we will enjoy only the finest of tastes and only the snootiest of laughter. Ah, so good. Um, Mabel goes up to Candy, who has something on the end of a fondue fork. And she keeps going back and forth between the cheese fountain and the chocolate fountain. I love this in particular because any like party that's really, really high class is absolutely not going to have a cheese or a chocolate fountain. Promise. It will not happen at a night, a genuinely like upscale party. But for the sake of the show, I understand what they're doing. And She's going back and forth and Mabel has to stop her and says, Candy, you're caught in a sweet, savory loop. Put the fork, fondue fork down. Guys, have you ever done this when you are in the middle of like a, maybe a day binging television where you're watching TV and you eat like way too many Cheetos and then you're like, okay, now I need something sweet. And so then you have like a piece of cake or ice cream and then you're like, all right, well, now I need something savory again. And then you just wind up doing that all damn day long. I have had days like that. It is not a good cycle to get into. I am not somebody who particularly loves sweets. Like, don't get me wrong. I'll love a slice of cheesecake or whatever, but I I don't tend to overdo it with sweets. I am much more likely to overdo it with savory food. Um, But nevertheless, I have definitely fallen into this trap before. And I can see how if you're somewhere that's very special and you're getting to try food that you've never tried before, how in particular this would happen. Um, so the girls are all standing there at this table when the uh, little Viennese rich boy comes in and Mabel immediately wants to come at him. And Greta, Grenda stops her and is like, we have a truce. Remember, we're not going to do this. But Candy asks Grenda to go and get some fancy napkins. And then she says to Mabel, I don't know if I can follow this truce. He is too adorable. And Grenda, I feel like her style of flirting is maybe a little bit too aggressive and might scare him away. And I really enjoy the fact that they don't make it that they're like, oh, Grenda's not as cute as us. So she would definitely like, you know, frighten them off because she's like so huge and intimidating and has like a dude voice. It's about her behavior more than anything. And then they show her going up to a dude and saying, Hey, what's on your shirt? And doing the like, uh, what do you call it? The, you know, when you slide up somebody's face, knocks his drinks out of his hand and calls him a loser. It's really quite a moment, Grenda. (laughs) Oh, girl, what are you doing? And when you see that, you are kind of like, okay, girls, I do kind of get your point. Not to say that I endorse this because y'all are being shitty and she will find out. But mm, still sucks, though. So we go back to uh, (laughs) to Pacifica and Dipper, who are running out um, one of the back lawns where there are a bunch of uh, peacocks running around. And they are running through this path that's covered in mud, trying to get to an area where there is a silver mirror um, in order to trap the thing into. But the mirror is on the other side of a room that is covered with one of Pacifica's parents' favorite carpet patterns. And they are tracking the mud on their feet. And she does not want to run into that room because her parents will absolutely lose their minds if they see that they stained the carpet. And she gets into a full on fight with Dipper about this, like the principle of going into this room they battle back and forth until they wind up like falling sideways through what turns out to be a secret 
doorway. But this moment, like, it's a really good indicator of just how afraid of her parents she is, that she is willing to put up physical resistance to going into that room because she's that afraid of what her parents are going to do. Um, so they go in and this room is full of like what look like paintings with, uh, what do you call them? Uh, sheets draped over them, like for storage. And she's standing in front of one of them and this like whole face and head and hands begins to come out to like grab at her and the ghost is in there with them it, as it turns out. And he knocks over a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that falls out of this box is a silver mirror, which uh, Dipper succeeds in trapping him inside. And then they get tossed out from the force of the trap out the window into the yard. And he looks into the mirror and sure enough, the ghost is in there. And I was like, genuinely surprised here. I was like, this is, I didn't expect it to be that simple. I sure didn't expect them to like trap it this early on in the episode. And that made me really wonder what was going to come next. I had no idea, you know? Um, and Pacifica gives him a huge hug but then like kind of comes back to herself and hands him some money and is like, can I pay you to forget that that ever happened? <laughs> to which I'm like, ah, oh, you guys, come on. So she invites him to stay to uh, attend the rest of the party. But he says that he has to go and dispose of this category 10 ghost. Um, so this is when he starts to be like, maybe she's not that bad after all. And he looks at the ghost who is laughing at him. And he says, like, you know, what's the big idea? And the ghost is like, oh, buddy, you're just as dumb as I was. And he talks about how the Northwests got him and all of his buddies to build this amazing town. Years of backbreaking labor and sacrifice. And we see the house on the hill, like the whole... uh skeleton of the house being built while in the foreground the landscape begins to change first of all there's like you know a um bunch of trees that are being cut down but also the uh grave markers of all of the people who died either like you know, because of building the house or at least while they were building the house. Like this is serious. They're not, the show got pretty dark with it. You know, all of the trees that, that are cut down and the men who are cut down. Um, but when it was time for the grand party, they promised the common folk of the town, they refused to let us in. And it's, we see them all laughing to themselves and slamming the door shut. And all of the men who worked on the house turn and walk away. And this guy comes up to the doors and pounds on them and says, with the uh, trees gone, the mudslides began. While they partied and laughed, I was swept away by the storm. And we see this like axe that goes flying through the air because of the mudslide and lands in the guy's skull. And he with his parting words says 150 years, I'll return from death. And if the gate is still closed to the town, wealthy blood will stain the ground, a curse passed down until this day. So this is when Dipper realizes that the Northwest could very easily have sidestepped this problem, but they decided it was more important to have their continuing uh, exclusive party than it was to do the right thing and also not have to deal with a ghost that was going to potentially hurt people and hurt their own child, I mean, as well. And it's just pretty gross, you know? It's just gross. That's all there is to it. Uh, yup. <laughs> Spoilers. Yes, it is. So he goes back and is like, what the fuck, guys? And they try and like act like it's no big deal. We don't even need you, whatever. He is 
doesn't really have any recourse because I think that like, as he says to the ghost, who's like, why don't you just let me free and I'll take care of this? He's like, my sister is in there with her friends. Like, you don't seem like somebody who's going to be real discerning about who you decide to uh, lay waste to. So I don't think so. And the ghost says, well, then let's let me look at the trees one more time. And he lifts the mirror up and does that. And for some reason, that's all it takes for this ghost to get out. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's fine. I It's fine. I don't mind it. So the ghost gets out and he begins to wreak havoc as he had promised in a very different way than what I expected. It turns out that he's going to turn everybody into wood, which is honestly pretty great. I kind of love it. I just didn't like, you know, I just did not think that was even an option. Like, I guess I didn't think that he'd be able to do anything to the people. He'd be able to manipulate objects that would hurt them was what I kind of expected, I guess, you know, like I could throw some knives around in the kitchen and stab somebody. But being able to actually turn people to wood. I like it. I'm here for that. Um, and meanwhile, Mabel and Candy are caught up in trying to flirt with this Van Housen. She doesn't know what Australia is. And she or what Austria is, she thinks he means Australia. And then when Candy starts talking to him, she like takes back over again and Candy gets pissed at her. And the two of them just start like uh, bitching back and forth to one another. And meanwhile, Van Housen just sort of sidesteps out of it because this is very awkward and he is not having a good time. And sure enough, Grenda sees them and realizes that they are flirting without her and she is disgusted. And when they say that her flirting style is a bit intense, she says, oh, you think I shouldn't be myself just because I'm in this stupid mansion. Um, and I guess these guys wouldn't like this, huh? And she goes up to Marius and does the, you've got something on your shirt and does the up his face. And Marius, as she walks away, gives this look like, Oh my goodness, what was that? And later on, he tracks her down and asks for her number. And it's a pretty great moment, honestly. This is the thing. Being yourself will attract the person to whom you should be yourself with. I will never, and I've always said this, I will never understand trying to pretend to not like things you like or to like things that you don't for the sake of a person because they are going to think that's who you are. And if you wind up staying with that person, you will then have to continue to pretend to not like things you like or to like things that you don't. It has never, ever, ever been my style. Not even when I was very young and insecure to do that kind of thing for, to get a dude's attention. I just wouldn't like, why would I want to be around a person who I share no interests with? Whether they're good looking and rich or not, so what? Like, it's just a misery to be around a person that you don't have anything in common with who you don't enjoy their company. Like, come on, you know? But anyway, um, the moment that the uh, ghost begins to take over the house, not only is he turning people to wood, but he's also bringing all of the animals that are like hung up on the walls and like um, around the building to life. Guys, I worked in a bank and I shared the photos of this when I first started working there. I worked at a bank that had animals, dead animals stuffed all over the place. And that same bank's like headquarters had a stuffed grizzly and the heads of about six, uh, stags on the walls. And those things are scary enough dead. But if they started coming to life, you could just stick a fork in me. That's the end of that. I would die. That's it. I just want to die. Um, so the ghost starts chanting about how 
a Northwest has to open the gates in order for all of this to stop in order for him to stop taking it out on everybody. And Dipper can see this light flashing off in the room that he and Pacifica found. And he goes in there and he's like, dude, what are you doing? She's just sitting there playing with her flashlight. And you're just sitting here while everybody is like being like the place is being laid waste. And he comes in and says, you know, he, he's asking her like, what the hell? Why are you sitting here like with this expression on your face? And she says, this is what I found in here. And we get to see the actual portraits, the versions of the portraits that, are in the dressing room. So the one where the guy is shaking hands with the Native American, he's like sneering and crossing his fingers behind his back. The one where the guy had been standing on top of a uh, uh, cliff's edge and looking like he had really accomplished something. We see a dude standing on the corpses of tons of dead animals. The one where the guy was holding bags of apples and looking like he was going to feed people. He's actually holding bags of money and wearing a robber's mask. And all of the people are crying out in terror. There's also a dude who's holding a, uh, uh, he looks more like a chipmunk. He's got like a crazy eyes, big buck teeth, a mustache, and he looks like a mad scientist. I don't know if he is going to have something to do with like the history of the town, but there is a part of me that thinks that's significant. And there's another guy that's like painted. Uh, he's down in the corner and he looks a little bit more modern and he almost looks like a cop or something. Um, but he's got this like fedora on. Um, and it was unclear to me. I'm like, is he, it's not a fedora. It's, it's like a, uh, I'm wondering if he's an, an, a Nazi. I'm not kidding guys. Like there's, there's a, a look to that portrait that I feel like they're trying to be like, maybe this dude worked for the SS. Do you know what I'm saying? And I don't know if I'm reading too much into that or what, but Oh, the show. I feel like they're saying something there. I really do. Um, but anyway, yeah. So when she explains to Dipper that she's feeling this way because she didn't realize that her parents are such trash, she says that he was right about her and that she is just another link in the world's worst chain which is pretty brutal. And he apologizes and is like, look, I'm sorry, but just because you're their daughter, it doesn't mean that you have to be the way they are. It's not too late. And just as he says, it's not too late. The ghost says, it's too late. You are all wood. And they walk out there and the whole place is kind of like overgrown. And all of the people have been turned into wood and there's like plants and vines everywhere. It's actually honestly pretty cool looking. I really enjoyed this. So Dipper winds up getting turned into wood. Very unexpected. I did not think that would happen. And this is when Pacifica is like, you know what? All right. Nobody's going to be here to like tell me to do the right thing. I guess I had better just do it. And she goes and puts her hands on the gates and her parents are in a trap door and they pop up and her father tells her not to do this, that they'll just wait it out. Basically, and I love this because guys, this is exactly how it works. Her parents have not suffered the consequences. Everybody at their party has suffered the consequences, but they had a special secret place to go to get away, which fucking, of course they do. Of course they do. And so they pop up, they have their butler. Her dad tells her that she can come in there with them and that they have enough food to last for a week. And that they, after that, they'll eat the butler. <laughs> um, and she, her, her dad finally pulls out the bell to get her to do what she is told. 
And she will not listen. She decides to do it anyway. And she pulls on the lever. And he, uh, <laughs> the the ghost winds up stopping and saying, you aren't like the other Northwests. And I'm like, look, that, I don't know if that's totally true. I will say she could have gotten away by hiding down there and she didn't. She chose to help everybody instead, but she probably would have gotten turned into wood anyway. Right. Like they revealed their hiding. Like it's one of those things where when your back is up against the wall and you do the right thing because you've kind of lost everything already, you don't get quite as much credit as you would if you'd just done the right thing to begin with. However, she is a child and so for that, I have to be more lenient. But yeah, she opens the gates and all of the townspeople come in and the ghost is watching and says, yes, yes, it's happening. My my heart, once as hard as oak, now grows soft like more of a birch or something. <laughs> and the house goes back to how it was. All of the vines disappear. The people who had turned into wood turn back into themselves. Um. And he tells Pacifica, I feel lumber justice, which uh, I don't really know what that even means. But yeah, he finally disappears because he has done what he needed to do. And meanwhile, all of the people who were waiting outside just completely come in and trash this party. And it is great. It is super fun. I... Me like, and this is the thing. People talk about like, well, can't you comport yourselves? Why bother if you never get to do shit like this? I hope everybody in my wedding behaves like this. Um. So, this is when Grenda gets approached by uh, Van Housen. It's a pretty good moment. Dipper and uh, and Pacifica trash her parents' favorite carpet and. She's like, seriously, I better go find someone to clean this up. Um, but then McGucket comes up to Dipper and he says, horns swoggle my goat's knees. Oh, God. So Dipper's like, hey, what's up, buddy? And McGucket grabs him, pulls him aside and says, Dipper, I've been looking for you. I fixed the laptop. I've been doing calculations and I think something terrible is coming. The apocalypse, the end times. And understandably, Dipper, who is extremely tired, who has been through a lot of shit this week, says, you know what, McGucket? How about we talk about this stuff tomorrow? Now, I would like to point out that when I pause this episode at this moment, in the background, there is a pretty wild, uh, what looks like a wall hanging, and I think it's meant to be Native American, of some people like kneeling in front of a tree underneath which are many bones buried in the ground. And I'm like, not sure if this has any relevance to what's happening here or what, but I just thought I should mention it. Um, he says, it's a party. Let's just have some fun for once. What do you think? And he walks away and McGucket opens the, uh, laptop and it says imminent threat, 21 hours and 30 minutes. And, oh, it does have to do because then the camera like pans over to it. I didn't even see that it panned over. How did I miss that? Because it pans over and then we have Bill, like the uh, triangle with the eye looking down at them. Well, shit. All right. That's a lot more direct than I thought. I thought this was a little subtle hint, but it's not. It's right fucking there. Um, I was too busy thinking about how it was just 21 hours and I didn't even like really notice. And this is when we have the uh, the two FBI agents who are apparently here undercover Um and they get into a little fight the way that a married couple would do. Guys, if you are somebody who carries a purse, you know what it's like to have to be responsible for everything that the other person owns. Men have pockets, yes. And for that, I will always be very jealous. But purses, everybody should have them. 
Everybody should have a purse. It's just silly that women are the only ones who do. Um, and I should mention too, that there's another, like there's been, as Melanie pointed out a while back, like code at the bottom of each episode after these little like end credit bits. But this one might be the longest one that I've seen that one. This one was really, really, really long. Um, and I didn't, you know, I'm not trying to figure it out. I'm not trying to detect anything, but I just wanted to mention that I noticed it and it's very, very like it was a paragraph practically. Um, so yeah. And that is the end of the episode. So I don't know. And next episode is not going to be until April and it's going to be a voyeur episode. So I won't be able to watch the next one until then. Um, and I'll be watching it live with you guys. So I'm super, super curious about how that's going to go. Um, I'm over time, so I'm going to have to wrap this one up. But thank you very, very much to Melanie for commissioning this episode. And thank you to Austin for coming and hanging out in the chat as well. And I'm very much looking forward to April. And I will see you all soon with a new one. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.